Over to you, Brian. I begin this uh, webinar by acknowledging the traditional custodians of all the lands on which we meet. I also acknowledge our gratitude that we share these lands today, our sorrow for the cost of that sharing, and our hope that we can move in unity to an Australia that is fair and just for all its Indigenous peoples. And I'll say the prayer issued by the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference in regard to Ukraine. God of peace and justice, who change the hardened heart and break the power of violence, we entrust the people of Ukraine to you. Protect them in this time of peril. Let them know not death, but life, not slavery, but freedom. You are father of all, we are brothers and sisters. Give us the strength to live the truth at that truth in love, choosing peace, not war, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks very much, Brian. And now it's my honour uh, to introduce our speaker for tonight for this uh, Australian Cardine Institute webinar, commemorating the opening, uh, the 60th anniversary of the opening of Vatican II, which took place in October 1962. We're honoured to have Matthijs Lambrichts, Emeritus Professor from the Catholic University of Leuven, the Dutch speaking side of which many Australians are also Emeritus students. Uh, I've met many people. Um, so I think we've got a lot of Australians connections with Louvain, uh, the old Louvain, I should say. Uh, Matthijs was is an expert on Vatican II was one of the writers for the famous five volume Bologna history of Vatican II. And uh, he taught Vatican II subjects for many years at, at Leuven and was um, the head of the Vatican II center that's, that's at uh, Louvain also. So without uh, going into it too much, I'd just like to hand over to Matthias to speak today on a famous uh, theologian of the council, Jared Phillips a long-time collaborator of Joseph Cardine and also promoter of the laity at the council. Thanks very much, Matthias. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Stephen. Um, thank you also for the invitation. That gives me the opportunity to speak about theologian, a senator, a promoter of the laity who was born in the same province I was born. So this is a talk of um, a Limburgian about a Limburgian. Uh, that is probably not the best approach because I, I should be uh, somebody from Antwerp, so that it could be more critical to Philips, but as citizen of Limburg, that will be hard. Anyway, let's give it a try. Uh, first, some introductory remarks. Um, I do know that the book of Conrad Jalon, ou une théologie du laïka, written in 1953, in most of the service is considered as the first serious book on the laity and about the theology of the laity. However, however, already in 1951, Gerard Phillips published the book, The Lake in the Kirk. And that book is translated in English uh, with a title, The Role of the Laity in the Church. Do you see the difference? In Dutch, it was the laity in the church. In English, it becomes the role of the laity in the church. In Spanish, it becomes towards an adult Christianity, and so on and so forth. In other words, this book of Phillips can be translated and interpreted in different directions. Anyway, it is the first coherent study on the role of the laity in the Roman Catholic Church. As you know, after World War II, the interest for the laity is growing. It's growing for many reasons. For instance, in the doctoral dissertation of Derek Glass, we see that in the region 
Britain, the Netherlands, Germany, Luxembourg, Belgium, that there is a decline of the number of vocations. There is also a growth of people who no longer attend mass on Sunday, and we are evaluating in the direction of the situation as it is already in France, where in 1943, Jordan published his book, uh, La France, un pays, uh, un pays de mission, France, a country of mission, making clear that there were huge problems coming uh, in the French Catholic community. The first World Congresses were organized in Rome in 1951 with 74 countries present and five continents. And the majority of the people present were lay people, men and women. And when Phillips was there, he discovered that the laity did not have proper information about a theology of the laity. And thus he decided to write his book, The Lake and the Keg, for the laity to help them to better understand their role, their ecclesiastical and theological role in the church. You must know that at that time in Belgium, lay students were not allowed to study theology at the Faculty of Theology of the KU Leuven. That was the privilege of priests and religious. And for that reason, Phillips, who was not only an academic, but also a very pastorally engaged person, decided to write this book. And he did it indeed in less than three months. For the first um, print was end 51, and it was so a success that it had to be reprinted in 52. But before I go to that book, I would like to tell you a bit about Philips. Philips was born in St. Treude in 1899, and St. Treude at that time was the town of the province of Limburg, but the province of Limburg was at that time still an integral part of the Diocese of Liège. The Diocese of Liège was being bilingual, in fact, I must say, they are bilingual, French and Dutch. It will only become trilingual after the First World War, when parts of Germany are given to Belgium as a compensation for the disasters during the war. Philips studied first in the minor seminary in St. Ruiden, where he also did his philosophy. And then he studied at the major seminary of Liège and at the Gregorian University, where he obtained in 1925 the Magister title. His Magister thesis was entitled La raison d'être du mal d'après Saint Augustin. And this Magister thesis was published in 1927. And up to today, it is considered to be a very valuable contribution to the reflections of Augustine on evil. Phillips, and that is something from which he will benefit for the rest of his life. Phillips had an excellent knowledge of Latin, Italian, and French. Uh, in the <clears throat> in the notes of Schillebix, you will read some frustration while Schillebix was trying, and we, we have the papers, while Schillebix was trying to write down a, a sentence in Latin, Phillips had already made a proposal. And so when Schillebix was ready with his, uh, with his sentence, they were already to the next paragraph. So there's a kind of frustration uh, in Schillebix because of that excellent knowledge of, um, of Phillips. Very important when you are discussing in Latin, in commissions, in conciliar commissions, in meetings whatsoever in Rome during the Second Vatican Council. Latin, the official language of the Roman Catholic Church, and Philips was a master, a master in it. In fact, in the 60s, in the beginning of the 60s, Philips was the only one 
who was still offering his lectures at the faculty in Latin. Um, others were gradually giving up the use of Latin, partly because they were not so familiar with Latin or partly because the students were no longer familiar with Latin. But Phillips taught in Latin and we still have his course notes in Latin. Nobody is reading them because of the Latin, but anyway, they are preserved. Then the second language is French. French is in fact, the, at the time, the most important theological language. To give one example, when the, the students of the American college will join the Louvain University in 1965, they are in the French program. You can't believe it, but it is true. And when we have the split in 68 and we organize an English program, only then they will join the, um, the Dutch section of the faculty because there is an English program. French at the time does being the most important theological language. Uh, and then the third one is Italian, as you know, the most important ecclesiastical language. And in fact, the lingua franca um, for Italians present in several of these commissions in Rome. Um, it's amazing, for instance, uh, just to give an example, it's amazing to see that the Italians want to have for the council a document on the knowledge of the Latin language and they do their proposals in Italian. They are promoting the Latin, but they do it in Italian. So Italian being the most important ecclesiastical language. When Phillips comes back to Belgium, he first becomes professor of philosophy in the minor seminary during two, two years. And then he becomes professor of dogmatic theology at the major seminary of Liège and this for 15 years. For, uh, for Philips, this is an, an important moment. Liège at that time is already secularized. It is indeed uh, since the 19th century, it is um, the happy, happy region with regard to industrialization and, and things like that. But at the same time, you see with, uh, that people more and more take their distance from the church in the diocese of Liège, French speaking site. So when between the two wars, uh, people discover coal in Limburg, you can immediately see, immediately see the challenge for the diocese of Liège. Will we have a repetition of what happened in the 19th century in Liège, or will we have in the province of Limburg an industrialization in which the church is not excluded and for which the church can, yeah, and, and in which the church can play a role. That is a huge um, challenge. And I must say that the, the Diocese of Liège for the Limburg side did not make the same mistake as they made in the 19th century. And thus from the very beginning, people like uh, Father Rutten or like Monsignor Brooks will organize, as it were, a kind of Catholic action taking into account the needs of the workers in the coal mine. Another thing that is important is that uh, after the Second World, after the First World War, a lot of Flemish soldiers are frustrated because of the way, uh, uh, because they were maltreated uh, during the First World War. As you know, several Flemish soldiers were killed because they didn't understand the French commitments of the officer. So after World, World War I, we have a serious linguistic problem in Belgium. And that explains why the Catholic action, the Flemish Catholic action, which is indeed an action in favor of students in, in, in the spiritual life of students, of the workers, men and women, is also related to the development of Flemish identity. And so you have a lot of tensions. You can see that, for instance, in the pilgrimage of 1931, you can see that um, Rome is informed by French-speaking superiors 
about the coming of Flemish youngsters and they will not be treated as it should be and will be frustrated about their uh, the accueil in Rome. Do also remember, uh, do also not forget that Mercier, Mercier, the great Mercier, uh, after World War I, uh, simply told us that Dutch is not an academic language. Uh, you can imagine that uh, every, every intellectual in Flanders was applauding uh, when he read this, Dutch is not an academic language. So Catholic action in Flanders is something special. It is like uh, elsewhere, it is an engagement, a commitment, a taking care, um, taking care of the needs of the workers and of the students. But it is also an there's also an element of linguistic concern. Um, in 1942, there happens something in Louvain. Louvain um, has not suffered that much from modernism because of the protection by Mercier of people like La Deuze or uh, Van Honaker. So Louvain did not get a condemnation in the period of anti-modernism. But anti-modernism does not end with the death of Pius X. And in, in a sense, it goes further. And so in 1942, Draguet, Draguet must leave the Faculty of Theology and has to go to the Faculty of Arts because Draguet was a great promoter of the historicity of Christian doctrine. And in 1942, that was still a very risky thing especially because in the scholastic approach, there is the eternal, unchangeable truth. And of course, you have to explain that in the context of time, but you cannot say that there is development uh, in, the, yeah, in the Christian doctrine and change, if I may say so. So Draguet has to step down, uh, becomes a professor at the Faculty of Arts, and for him, this was a good thing because he now was only expected to study uh, Syriac texts and he became world and uh, worldwide uh, an authority in the critical edition of Syriac texts. Van Rooy wanted to have a safe theologian in Leuven and thus he appointed Philips. And this, of course, was not uh, well received by the Faculty of Theology. The Faculty of Theology considered this as a kind of an intrusion of the Cardinal in the daily life of the Faculty. And that also explains why Philips, before the Second Vatican Council, was not always well respected by his colleagues, especially by the exegetes. For Philips, for them, came from Rome. And as you know, <clears throat> um, the people um, in Rome were not very well appreciated in Leuven. However, Philips, and that is typical of Philips, he accepted that he was not the beloved son of the faculty, but he showed to be a serious scholar. Uh, Philips returned, uh, was much more interested in patristic theology then, for instance, in scholastic theology. And thus, he was really the man who focused on not only Augustine, but also on the Greek fathers. And as you know, what is typical of Vatican II, that is the return of patristics. The numero uno in the quotes of Vatican II is Augustine, not Thomas Aquinas. Then, the ecclesiology he develops is in relation to Catholic action. The book I mentioned already, The Lake and the Care, is a plea for an adult lay people. Adult lay people, that means lay people who are responsible, faithful, taking their respons responsibility in the church. And remember the structure of Lumen Gentium. First, you have the people of God, and then the hierarchy. That is something which is changed in the second session. Before that, you had in the structure first, the hierarchy, then the people of God. 
but that will change. And uh, it is Phillips who indeed, we can find that in the papers, Phillips indeed, who stressed the point that we first are children of God, and then we take responsibilities on the level of a hierarchy. And then he was a great connoisseur of um, Mariology, and he always published articles and books focusing on a Christological Mariology. And as you know, there was a tension at the council with regard to chapter eight between Balich and Phillips. And at the end of the day, people will follow the text of Phillips on Mary. And so, therefore you have a very biblical, a very biblical presentation of Mary in chapter eight of Lumen Gentium. Phillips was an academic, was a professor, but was also a man who was engaged uh, serving the faithful. So he played an, an active role in the Davis Fund, which is the Catholic uh, cultural organization promoting the use of Dutch uh, in intellectual milieus. He was a member of the Catholic Youth Movement and became the president of it in 1952. He was always present in the international congresses of, on the lay apostolate. And every time he was present as a keynote speaker, as we use to say today. Okay, then I was also a member of the, the, uh, the Comité Permanent the Congrès International de la, de la Apostola Laïque, but uh, my time is running. And so I have to say something about the politician, Philips. Um, Phillips was member of the Belgian parliament from 1953 to 1968. And that was because the province of Limburg, the provincial council of Lim Limburg co-opted Phillips in 1953 as the successor of the great hero Monsignor Brooks, who has done a lot for the Catholic workers, workers' movement in the province of Limburg. And they really wanted to have in the, the then CVP, the Christian People's Party, they wanted to have a priest again. And thus they asked the professor, the, um, <clears throat> the president of the youth movement, uh, Phillips, uh, they co-opted him as a senator in the Belgian parliament. And as a politician, Phillips, Phillips played an important role in the Belgian School Pact of 1958. As you know, in Belgium, we have a very strange system. That means that the, the Catholic schools, that the Catholic schools, like mm, the, the state schools, are subsidized, subsidized by the state, but have their own uh, intellectual and ideological autonomy. This is unique. Uh, in Belgium, I don't think that you will find it elsewhere. In Belgium, the state is paying the Catholic schools, even although the Catholic schools uh, develop their own programs. Phillips played a very important role in that Belgian school. Phillips already in 1954 is traveling to Congo and is involved in the foundation of the University Lovanium in Kinshasa. And he convinces the government that in this University of Lovanium, there is also the need to have a theological faculty, which will then be founded in 58. Um, I said already in the beginning that Phillips is really tri well, four lingual. Huh? So he speaks very well French, but at the same time, he is a promoter of the development of the Flemish um, identity. But he always does so in full respect for the French speaking people. And you can see that in the notes, for instance, of uh, the council notes of uh, Charu, the Bishop of Namur, um, he is always uh, respecting the, um, the way in which Philips is treating people. Phillips is, in a sense, Phillips was a shy man, but it was also the man was also a politician. Uh, Phillips used to say that uh, you better have a, a bad compromise 
than a good war. So he was a man who was looking for compromises. And he always said that when you are the winner, do not humil humiliate your, um, your opponents. For one day, you can lose the majority, what happens in politics, and then they probably will take their re revenge. So Phillips is really the antipode of people like Kung and Schillebeek. Kung and Schillebeek were people who wanted, uh, wanted to uh, convince everybody that their view on theology and their view on the church was the correct one. And you can see that in interviews uh, Schillebeek gave uh, to the Dutch television, he is always criticizing the compromises which are yeah, the result of a council. While for Phillips, a council is trying to, to, to create consensus. It's not, a council is not a meeting of political parties. A council is not a meeting of theological schools. A council is a place where bishops responsible for the church try to find a consensus about important topics. So Philip is really an antipode of King and Schilbeek. And I say this in, a, in an objective way. I mean, I can well understand why King and Schilbeek sometimes were upset by the compromises. And But at the end of the day, it is either a compromise or it is nothing. As we know, for instance, with regard to chapter two, three of it then will be Lumen Gentium about the hierarchy and the relation between the Pope and the bishops and the matter of collegiality. At a given moment in 64, people feared that there would be no chapter three. We can see that here in the papers, no chapter three. And I think it's better to have this text than no text. So you can see the stutter between Phillips, and there's also in the exchange of letters, the, between Phillips and King Schillebeek, but also Dossetti, uh, the spiritual father of Giuseppe Alberigo, that there are tensions. Okay. Then Phillips and Vatican II. Uh, Phillips um, was present at the council from the very beginning. He was a member of the Preparatory Theological Commission, but uh, Ottaviani considered, let me say so, this commission as a kind of handmaid of the Holy Office. Um, so for the Preparatory Theological Co Commission was clear, everything that had to do with doctrine and had to do with theology was the work of the Preparatory Theological Commission, read the Holy Office, while the others were expected to engage in disciplinary matters. That is one of the things that you have to take into account when you so know and then com hear complaints about the poor quality of other uh, schemata uh, prepared in this period. If you, do, if you are not allowed to engage in theological questions, then of course, you will get um, dry uh, text without a real spirit. Do also not forget that we are in 1960 and that people like Congar and de Lubac, who were invited in the Preparatory Theological Commission, <clears throat> that they meet there, their own persecutors. De Lubac had gave up for a while his uh, teaching in Lyon, Congar lived for a while in exile in, in England and discovered their Newman. That was not, uh, of course, the reason why they sent them to England, but that was a good thing. So there are problems uh, between Congar and the Lubac and the people, the people sitting there in front of them, the people who had uh, caused a lot of problems to them. Um, but there is one thing that I have to say, um, Maybe also a bit as a reaction, as a reaction against, as a reaction against the idea that nothing happened in the preparatory period. But in the preparatory period, there was the idea to prepare a theological schema on the laity, and we, I, I checked it in the papers. Phillips, you will find a schema Congar and a schema Phillips. 
But finally, the commission will opt for the Philips schema, which after six revisions will be approved. And what is interesting, when uh, Philips is writing his schema on the, uh, the Ecclesia, he will use his own draft when he is drafting the schema on the church in 1963. Um, I think that um, I have, that it's just for your common knowledge, I think, uh, for your general knowledge, I think that the real breakthrough in the council is, is the breakthrough made by John XXIII. When you have the crisis about the sources of revelation, then John XXIII will intervene and he will create a mixed commission and thus giving the members in the council the feeling that there is something like conciliar freedom. And that is really a breakthrough, I think. From then on, you see that more bishops are daring, uh, more bishops are intervening. And I give here as an example, the devastating speech of the Svet on the schema, uh, the Ecclesia, where he accuses the text of clericalism legalism and triumphalism. You know, triumphalism did not exist in uh, in France, and uh, in French. And when you take uh, Robert, Robert published in 1962, you will not find the word triumphalisme. But when you take then the Le Petit Robert, published in 1964-65, then you will suddenly see triumphalisme, uh, a word, for the first time used by Bishop de Smet uh, in the Second Vatican Council. A devastating speech, speech of the Smet, and it was clear that uh, the schema de Ecclesia as prepared before the Council had no chance. And then is the question, is it Belgian disobedience? I don't believe that. We are courageous, but not disobedience. The others, of course, will tell you the opposite, but anyway, um, when the schema de Ecclesia is finally uh, handed out on November 23, then a lot of critique is already formulated on previous versions. In a sense, the intervention of Taviani is correct when he says you are already condemning a document before you have read it, for the final version is indeed November 23. But the previous versions were already heavily criticized, for instance, by Schillebeek uh, when he was asked by the Dutch bishops uh, to give his comments on what was already prepared. And students, students well aware of the fact that De Ecclesia had no chance, already asked on October the 15th, that means six weeks before the discussion of the Ecclesia uh, on October the 15th, he asks Philips to start with the preparation of a new schema. And here you will see uh, <clears throat> the Homo Conciliare. Uh, Philips prepares a text that then starts um, organizing meetings with international, uh, with an international team of theologians, people like Karel Rahner, like Congar, with whom he had already contacts before the council, with Colombo, as you know, the personal uh, theologian of the Pope, Semmelhoort, we all, when we were young, we had to study Semmelhoort because he was such a great exegete, and then McGrath, the Bishop of Panama, who uh, had his own schema, the Ecclesia, which, which did not reach the council, but a very, a very interesting person, and thus contacted by Phillips. There's also something which is interesting. Philips um, has, has a nose, has a nose, if I may say so, for good theologians who are willing, who are willing to go for compromises. So you see here in this international team of theologians, you do not see the names of, for instance, Schillewitz, for instance, uh, Kung. But Rahner is there, and Rahner is a man who is willing to go for compromises. There are many sch schemata, but there is no winner. I say this because Phillips didn't like the winner-loser vocabulary. Uh, he, uh, we published a couple of years ago his, uh, his own diary, and it is clear that for him, 
the work in the council is a work at the service of the church, that is a work under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that is a work uh, that must be guided and supported by prayer, it is a work where you look for solutions. So Philip does not speak of winner, loser. Uh, and I think that that plays a role uh, in the acceptance of his schema, the Ecclesia, as prepared here in Leuven in the 10th Sylvest, 27, after consultation of students and tools. Phillips is praised for his, uh, he is a gentleman, and that explains why he becomes uh, in December 63, the adjunct secretary of the Theological Commission, and de facto, de facto, Phillips will be the intellectual leader of this commission up to the day that he, in October 65, gets a heart, a heart attack. It's not any, uh, yeah, that's clearly a mistake, it will be a heart attack. And that you can check if you don't believe me, because you know that I am coming from Limburg, like Philips. If you don't believe me, you should check that in the diary of Congar, which is, as you know, already translated in English too. Students, uh, Philips is a homo conciliaris, and he makes use of exist existing expertise, for instance. He knew that he was not an exegete and that his exegetical training in Rome had, could have been better. So he asked the advisors of people like uh, Serpo, <coughs> like Charou Char or Benoit. Um, he is a man who knows that in the parliament, um, negotiation, discussion, meetings are important. So the Belgian College in Rome near to the Vatican, but not too near, becomes, as it were, a, yeah, the center of the activities of the Squadra Belga in Rome, and a lot of people will come to the meetings over there. Phillips is a clever person, so from the very beginning, before, before that the sex before the text on the, the Ecclesia was discussed, the first text of uh, Ottaviani, he already asked the Secretariat for the Promotion of the Christian Union, Unity, SCUF, he asked him already for an advice. <coughs> when Jean Yebet asked him what he was doing uh, before the 23rd of uh, November, Jean Yebet had heard somewhere that, uh, soon as, uh, that Phillips was preparing a new schema. Then he said, well, I'm just thinking a bit, but when on the 23rd, the first schema, the Ecclesia was uh, handed out in the, in, the, um, in the aula, 300, 400 copies of the new text of Phillips were brought to all kinds of colleges and places where bishops were coming together. But Phillips was well aware that if Sanjibé had known that he was preparing a new schema, then Ganyebe would have run to Ottaviani and the whole maneuver was then uh, doomed to fail. He knew that the council is a matter of consensus, a consensus that I already said, and then he was a tireless worker. Um, I must say here that um, Phillips had the great, the great, <clears throat> a gift to, to work very hard and to learn others how to work. So whenever you had to work with Phillips, you had to work hard yourself. And if you don't believe me, this now is a bit too late, you could have asked his sister Rosa, his sister Rosa, uh, who was, as it were, his private secretary and typed for students, uh, for Phillips, thousands and thousands of pages. Students is a team player. He works with subcommissions, but everybody in the subcommission must work as hard as Phillips. And then that he was a really, really a good organizer that becomes clear in the way in which he uh, tackled the Modi. All in all, there were more than 10,000 Modi. And he asked two of the students in the Belgian college, Monsignor, uh, the later Monsignor de Klerk, and um, 
Claude Parfontaine to write all the modi on cards and to uh, give them an order so that he could easily go through the modi. And as you know, his work on the modi is by most people very much appreciated. Phillips was really important for Lumen Gentium, and you can say that the chapters two, two and eight are the, the Phillips chapters. The other chapters, of course, he played an important role in it, certainly also in chapter three, where he tried to explain that um, collegiality did not exclude the primacy of the Pope as the head of the college. Uh, also there, he played an important role, but especially two and eight, or as it were, the Phillips chapters. But he was also involved in other documents like on revelation and on the church in the world. Maybe to reveal some of the secrets, the part on marriage in Guardian Espes is written in Helsinki, the capital of the province Phillips was born, and the president of that subcommission writing this this part of Guardian Express was Monsignor Hirschen, a good friend of Philip's, um, uh, yeah, and, uh, and a good collaborator too of uh, Philip's. And now let me, for the last 10 minutes, say something about the leak in the Kerk. I hope that I made clear that, that Philip's was a great organizer, a great politician, he was also a great academic, that's true for sure. And he was a man of the council and of conciliar consensus. But he was also the man who promoted the case of the laity in the church. Uh, the book, The Lake in the Kerk, I have here with me uh, all kinds of translations and reprints of translations. It was translated in French, in German, English, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese. But what is interesting here is that the standard text for the translations in German, etc., is the French text. But the French text is censored. In the French text, uh, the critique on the Curia is less outspoken than in the Dutch text. Of course, now you all think, think well, these Flemish people, these Pharisees, Maybe you're right, these Pharisees, but often, uh, and that even happens these days, often when people want to say something they really believe in, but consider it as maybe a bit too dangerous in some places in the center of Italy, they will publish it in Dutch, but with slight corrections, corrections, than in French or in English. So um, I, what I present here is of the un uncensored version in Dutch and not the version in French or in English. Um, Philips is very clear from the very beginning, the church, he says, is an hierarchical, uh, hierarchically structured institution. No doubt about that, yeah? But then, Pages and pages, he is tackling a real problem, namely that the church is too much a legalistic institution and that the authority in the church is exercised by people who love to have the power but miss the authority. And this, uh, the first chapter is, a, is, a, is rather a rather severe analysis of what is going on in the hierarchy. And so he concludes a chapter stating that the hierarchy must gain the trust of the faithful through its own way of living. The hierarchy has uh, bases his, uh, its authority on the way the hierarchy is living. And then the, in the second uh, chapter, he is emphasizing that the church cannot be separated from the world. The church for, for Philips is not the Civitas Perfecta. Uh, the church for Philips is church in the world and is mission. The church has the, the task and the duty 
to spread the gospel in the world. Uh, for, already in 52, today everybody is saying this, but already in 52, Phillips, who was really fluent in Latin, questioned the use of Latin in the liturgy. For he believed that active participation and the use of the vernacular would contribute, contribute to the uh, development of a community life. He also emphasized that the, um, the temple in Se deserves our appreciation. Here he says something about, for instance, um, atheists, socialists, uh, non-Catholics, uh, who in fact are also contributing to the welfare of the people in society. And that's one of the reasons why it was so easy for Phillips to collaborate with socialists and liberals when he was a senator in the Belgian parliament. Thus, he can appreciate the temporal, uh, but he is also, of course, a man who is looking for a, say, if I may say so, for a new, for a new um, ecclesiastical model. And in that model, he has four points with regard to the engagement of the laity. The first is the mission of the laity. The second is the regretted laziness. And of course, now you're uh, curious, what can that mean? Eh? Regretted laziness, just two minutes. Uh, and then the need of reform and the forms of engagement. But first, the mission of the laity. Uh, in the beginning of the 50s, when he wrote his book, uh, many people were of the opinion that going to Mars on Sunday was an excellent proof uh, of their uh, being a Catholic. And for Phillips, that was not enough. Phillips was uh, uh, a man who said that the church must do more than just worshiping. Uh, so for him, and he sometimes was a bit unhappy about it, for him, uh, the laity, the Catholic laity, must play a role in the public intellectual life. And, and what he means with that is that the laity must take the floor, must uh, testify its faith and convictions, and thus must influence the, li the public life in the society. Uh, and here, of course, I must say that uh, both in Flanders and in the Catholic part of the Netherlands, uh, since since the beginning of the 20th century, the, the Catholics were more obedient than in other places. Um, on the one hand, and on the other, that they were more interested in, in actions in the social domain than in reflecting on these actions from the point of view of the gospel. Um, for Philip's uh, two examples he admired were Francis and Teresa of Avila, uh, and when he is speaking about the gift of the Holy Spirit, one of his last books, he didn't finish it, was on the Holy Spirit and on the fact that the Holy Spirit was given to all people, including the lay people. Well, here you have, he makes his point already in 52, everybody has received the Holy Spirit. The reason why in Lumen Gentium, uh, chapter three on the laity becomes chapter two, the people of God, that the reason for that you find it already here. Everybody first becomes first becomes uh, a child of the church, and then some of them take hierarchical um, responsibilities in the church. So for Phillips, uh, everybody has a vocation, and you have to act and live according to your vocation. And already in sixty in fifty two, he says. Um, Lay people are not second class people. Thus, even when the hierarchy makes objections, continue. That reminds me of, a, of a, a, a talk I had with Daniels when I was for the first time uh, dean in 2000. And Daniels said exactly the same. He said, when you, have to co when you come to Mechelen and you have to ask something and you know that I have to say no, do not come, but do it. Well, I think this is a, a bit also what here with Phillips. Uh, even when the hierarchy objects and you think it must be done, 
do it for as baptized people, you are not second class people. And uh, then, of course, he had a sense of humor. He said, without married people, uh, without married people, there would be no hierarchy because all are children of someone. The mission of the laity regretted laziness that has to do with the, uh, the sometimes ridiculous obedience of the faithful, the lazy obedience, as uh, Phillips calls it, the lazy obedience of the faithful. It's easier to obey and then to say, I do what they ask me to do, and that's it. Um, here, Phillips several times said, said, we can learn from the Protestants and the communists how we should take our own responsibility as Catholics. The Catholic laity cannot hand over its own work and responsibility to the hierarchy. You see that here I was uh, preparing my, my PowerPoint, it was already 11 o'clock, and so you see that uh, the mistakes are entering into the PowerPoint, yeah. Uh, but I thought that a PowerPoint could be helpful instead of reading my text. Then reform is needed. Of course, uh, in the 50s in Flanders, it is clear that the social developments, the industrialization, after, uh, especially in Limburg, but also uh, the restoration of many, many uh, places after the, the Second World War that will affect the life of the church. Also, the fact that you have new great centers, Ghent, Antwerp, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands of people are leaving their provinces, going to the, 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 the big cities, and this, that will have an effect on the life of the church. Think, for instance, of Ghent, where in the center in 54, less than 25% of the people went to the church. In uh, St. Nicholas, it was more or less the same. The same was also true in ours. Thus, the industrialization will have an effect on the life of the church in Flanders. One of the other things uh, Philip regularly speaks about is, what is the impact of these great papal social encyclicals on the life of the Christian managers, Christian businessmen? Those who, as Christians, have their own fabrics, their own manufacturers, their own uh, yeah, their own organizations. How does how does um, the social teaching of the church impact uh, the the work of these men? And so, for him, it is clear that the, the, the church and the church that we are all the church. The church has only one task: make Christ visible in this world. Thus, responsibility, but as lay people, not as slip bearers of bishops. In the, in the Dutch version, <clears throat> slip and drags comes back time and again. Philips is convinced that the lay people, as lay people, must take a responsibility. And thus he invites to collaboration with all people of goodwill. And then what he also is describing in his book is, well, what he is criticizing, that is uh, religious infantilization. And it is interesting that in, uh, in the Portuguese, the Portuguese translation, the title is Para um Cristianismo Adulto, towards an adult Christianity. Christianism, Cristianismo Adulto. So, the book he wrote in 52 wants to be a contribution to an adult, adult uh, Catholicity, adult Christianity. And then what are the forms of engagement? Uh, of course, um, lay people are expected to reflect on their own faith in a responsible way. But then it comes, Phillips was in no, in no way an admirer of Van Balthazar. He was really opposed to Van Balthazar's idea of the secular institutes. You know that Van Balthazar was a, a severe critique of the Catholic action. And the Catholic action that was something uh, and that had um, Philips in common with Cardin, Catholic action for them, that was the core business. And so Philips didn't like the critique of Van Balthazar on this Catholic action. And he said that what Van Balthazar is doing 
is the clericalization of the secular institutes. And thus Phillips, who was a man of prayer, thinks that a monastic life is good, but he says, this is of no help for married people. Eh? And thus um, he was convinced that uh, societal engagement inspired by Christ uh, should be, as it were, the basis for a true uh, lay spirituality. That the Catholic action at the time was challenging is clear. I don't have to read a bit further. And so towards a true lay spirituality. It's interesting to see that Phillips, uh, that is typical of Phillips and of the man, the homo conciliare, but also the, the man of consensus. He can also listen to those who are criticizing him or are criticizing him. For instance, he liked Schillebeck's definition that lay spirituality has to do with the integral view of life of a Christian. That lay spirituality is not something that you have to develop on a Sunday morning during one hour. No, it must be part of your whole life. And thus, he was opposed to that normal monastic spirituality for the laity as promoted by von Balthasar. Um, so, uh, lay spirituality must be inspired by the ordination of the profane, as he said. And there's, and here, uh, there's an idea I like, uh, like uh, we are in 1951, and uh, Phillips uh, somewhere remarks, it is easy, uh, the vow of poverty is easy to make when you're a member of a rich order, but it's more difficult when you're as a worker or living in poverty. We are in 51, eh? 51, he says, well, the vow of poverty when you are a member of a rich order, no problem, but it is hard to be poor when you are living as a worker somewhere in a small house. And then um, he also was convinced that religious could learn a lot from the workers when discussing obedience. The worker, indeed, he says, has no income when he, she does not obey to the boss. It's easy to discuss this obedience, uh, discuss obedience when you are in a good situation, but the worker sometimes has no other, has no other choice, no other right than to obey. And then the last thing that is uh, about holiness, uh, it will be clear that for, um, for Philip's holiness, it's not a privilege of the religious, uh, although they have more saints than there are lay people who are saints, holiness is present everywhere, also among the common faithful. So, and then in the conclusion, but I think I already spoke too long. Conclusion, he was a professor, a priest, a politician, that's clear, but he was a man with a demanding heart, demanding heart for the faithful and demanding heart in many senses. He also expected them to take their responsibility. I leave it here. Is that okay? Well, thank you very much, Matthias. That's fantastic. Yeah, well, you really brought alive um, Jared Phillips. I think he was uh, not just demanding on the faithful. I think he was very demanding on, the, on himself. As you mentioned, he had a heart attack um, towards the end of the council. I don't know if it shortened his life, but uh, when I was doing my research on Vatican II, I was really struck by how hard these people worked. So you mentioned the number of Modi, the amendments that they worked on. And uh, I think you've also shown um, kind of how Vatican II didn't just fall from the air in tongues of fire, but it was a product of uh, human beings in their own historical context. And uh, I think, you know, I've always felt for a long time that uh, Jared Phillips has remained in the shadows. We speak a lot about Conga and La Nouvelle theology and all that, but somehow we, perhaps because we don't know Dutch, perhaps we don't know enough, we haven't known enough about Jared Phillips, the person who's responsible for so much. So thanks very much for that. But uh, I see there's a number of comments in the chat. Um, let me have a look at them, or if somebody would just like to pipe up and pose your question or read out your comment, feel free to do so. Uh, Kevin, Kevin Wright was asking, how does the focus on Augustine rather than Thomas Aquinas affect the theology of Vatican II? Do you want to say anything about that, Kevin? 
Kevin was can't see. Sorry, um, just that's uh, that's what what um, our speaker was talking about. The the influence of Augustine was stronger uh, on Vatican II than was the influence of Thomas Aquinas. So I just wondered, what does that actually mean in practical terms? That is a, is a very, a very interesting question. And uh, um, let me start with the following. Uh, before, during the preparation, during the preparation, uh, the preparatory commission for the seminaries and the universities intended to prepare a schema on Thomas making clear that Thomas was the doctor communis, the best of all theologians, the synthesis of the patristic era and the source for the theology after, uh, after Thomas. And already there in that commission, there is a huge debate between people like Bishop Adam of Siam in Switzerland and uh, Hubert Jedin on the one hand, and uh, people like Fabro of the Urbaniana on the other hand. And what is the point there? The point is that according to people like um, Yedin, professor uh, at the University of Bonn, also Blanchet, rector at the Institut Catholique de Paris, for them, there is not something like one method, the Thomas method. For them, there is a diversity of methods. And as Yedin, says time and again, you cannot use the Thomistic method in exegesis and in church history. And thus, Phillips himself, in his preparation, is very much convinced, and you see that also in his biology, that you have to start from the data, from what is given, what is offered by, what is given, what is offered by the, um, yeah, by scripture, and that you have to take into account, if I may say so, a certain pluralism. And when we speak of pluralism, then we all spontaneously think, of course, of the patristic era, where you have, as it were, many directions. And Phillips is, as it were, opposed to, the do to a dominant, dominant scholastic approach. But so that would be one method dominating the evolutions in the theology. And that is what I mean when I say that uh, Thomas is put aside in the debates. People no longer, no longer want to hear about one method and one approach at a moment that the world is changing. Uh, as I said by one of the, these Italian uh, seminary professors uh, is, who was opposed to, to the praise of, of Thomas, he said, we need, we need a vocabulary that is able to translate, translate the ideas of Thomas into today. And it cannot, um, as it were, bridge the gap without interpretation, without hermeneutics. And that's what you will see, uh, certainly in Lumen Gentium, when you take Lumen Gentium, I had to take it here, yeah? When you take the text, this is fuller, this is really full of all, kinds of references, references to, um, for instance, uh, to, to scripture, of course, but also to the letter to Diognetus, to John Chrysostom, to Ori Origen, to Pseudo Macarius, et cetera, et cetera. Thus, the diversity present in the early church must be, as it were, represented in the, the documents of Vatican II. The only document where this doesn't happen is, of course, as you know, the document Inter Merifica on the social communication media. I hope that I gave an answer to your question, Kevin. I think that was great. Thank you so much. I see that Martin has a question, Martin Arnold, about the spirit moving where it will. Do you want to speak to that, Martin? Fortunately, I think your microphone's uh, got a little problem there. Um, yeah, we, 
Unfortunately, we're not hearing you, Martin. Yeah, I don't know if you want to try again. Otherwise, we'll see if anybody else has got a comment and we might come back to Martin. Um, if anybody else, let's see. Um, uh, I see Richard. Richard Putz has spoke, made a comment about clericalism as an outcome of uh, patriarchy. Uh, would you like to make a comment about that, Richard? Yeah, it's about five o'clock in the morning here. Can you hear me? Uh, we can yeah. hear you. A bit muted, but we can hear you. Uh, must be a problem with my internet. Richard's. Uh, well, not that not the distance that makes a difference, but it's very early in the morning in the USA. I know Richard's from, I'm not sure which, <laughs> which city, but uh, I know we have to get that very early to listen to this. Don't worry. Okay. Anyway, was there, anyway, do you want to make any comment, Matthias, about uh, the pa link of patriarchy and clericalism? In the, in before the before this meeting started, we were talking about synodality. It was with Max and synodality and collegiality and things like that. And um, I think that that what Richard is saying is. It's very true for synodality or collegiality can only become successful from the moment that we are giving up the absolute monarchy. The structure, the structure uh, of the Catholic Church is based on the medieval concept of the absolute monarchy. And like uh, you have Pope, then the bishops in the Middle Ages that were speaking of the prince bishops. Today, the prince is no longer present, but many still behave like prince bishops. And that is on the basis of the absolute monarchy. That is on the basis of the, the model of the Church of Antioch. Well, there is also another model, the model of the Church of Smyrna, uh, where uh, the community is involved in the appointment of its own ministers. Of course, it also has its problem, but its own ministers, but where this, the, the, the idea of the, the sense of belonging is much higher. And so I do think that um, like the part of familias no longer is accepted in, in let's say in contemporary uh, society, we should also dare to think of giving up and part of familias idea in the church and opt for an uh, yeah and uh, yeah opt for a kind of smirna model where all are involved in the decision decision making of the church um pope benedict pope benedict when he was pope uh, already started with with intervening in appointments of bishops in the united states I think that Richard uh, is in the United States. And he wanted to avoid bishops who are making careers. They start in a smaller place and then grow and grow and grow and grow. And it is as it were part of their parcours and their ambition. I think that local communities can, when they are really uh, invited, invited, and they are waiting to be invited, invited in the decision making of their own communities then and only then you can go switch from radicalism to a real synodality but that means that you give up the absolute monarchy that would be my answer to uh, to the question or the remark of richard richard and i must say that i agree with what he said about feudalism the prince bishop is indeed a remnant of the feudal uh, feudalism of the Middle Ages. Uh, actually, Martin has just asked me to follow up uh, what, with his question. Um, uh, is an appeal to the Holy Spirit the best grounding for avoiding clericalism? That was Martin's question. He had a problem with his microphone. Um, yeah, the, the way he, he uh, phrased it, that makes clear that he has something in mind when he puts 
between brackets appear. Uh, yeah, this is, I would say, I would say yes in the sense that through baptism people become members of the community, and there is not as it were. Um, yeah. and the, the Holy Spirit as given to the faithful in baptism is not another Holy Spirit than the Holy Spirit um, uh, that, that people uh, receive during ordination. It's always the one and the same Holy Spirit. It is like uh, venerating uh, Mary and the saying that, that Mary is better in Lourdes than, for instance, in Baneux in Belgium. And that's nonsense, of course, it's always the same Mary. Eh? It's, whether it's the Mary of Lourdes or the Mary of Baneux, it's always the same uh, Holy Spirit. Moreover, there are uh, hundreds, thousands of qualities which are better represented by uh, lay people, and that was something Phillips was right in, better presented and represented by lay people than by, by for instance, uh, the clergy. I think here of uh, management functions, I think here of pedagogical qualities, I think here of uh, psychological expertise, think of the entrepreneurs, of the civil engineers, etc., etc. The point is that for Phillips, that all these people should use their expertise in order to make Christ visible. And then, of course, the appeal to the Holy Spirit understood in that sense, in that sense, and only in that sense, I think is the best grounding for avoiding clericalism which very often is a protection, a protection of one's own domain. We have seen that very clearly, both in the pastoral council in the Netherlands and in the reaction in the beginning of the 70s, and in the creation of the interdiocesan pastoral council in Belgium, the first, the first reaction of hundreds of priests was a reaction of fear, fearing that they would lose their own autonomy and would lose their own uh, authority and would lose their own power. And it is only in the 80s and the 90s that you see that the, the atmosphere is changing, but probably too late. Uh, the, former, the former president of uh, uh, Kerrigan Leven, Church and Life here in our country, told me last Friday, that one of the greatest mistakes made, made after the council up to the current day is that the church leaders did not ask enough, uh, did not invite enough the faithful to take their responsibilities within the ecclesiastical life. And he considered that as the biggest mistake in the reception uh, or the non-reception of the Second Vatican Council. So I do think that, yes, uh, when you understand the Holy Spirit in the sense as described by Phillips, that is indeed the best grounding for avoiding clericalism. But then of course, everybody must be convinced that everybody has received the one and same Holy Spirit. And I think that much could be solved by rethinking, rethinking uh, priesthood, religious life, rethinking it as a service to the church community, just as the laity are expected to serve to the church community. And I think you can uh, solve a lot of problems or tensions. Uh, and Tony has a question. Tony, would you like to speak to that? Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Martes. That was very interesting. I've certainly learned a lot. Um, I just wondered if you could speak to some of the influences on Gerard. So where did he receive some of the inspiration for his ideas, especially around the laity and the Holy Spirit? Uh, um, for, with regard to the laity, um, he, I, uh, yeah, you will never, you never visit Liège. Eh? That's a pity, yeah? but when you visit Liège and when you see where the, the scenery is situated, from there, you can see um, the manufacturers and the and the, and the industrial zone in Liège. He simply sees 
he sees as a priest, as a professor, he sees the workers, yeah? That's for one. For two, in Limburg, Limburg was uh, one of the poorest, maybe, well, probably the poorest, no, one of the poorest provinces of the country between the two world wars. There was no industry, there was nothing, but Phillips discovered that there was a great intellectual potential in the province. And so he was convinced that the church should invest and that the priests, and at the time you had many priests uh, as professors in secondary schools, uh, and, and he was convinced that the church should invest in the intellectual training formation of the young uh, lay people. And so that is the second element. The third is, of course, that he was convinced that it was worth to develop a Flemish identity that would be a benefit for the self-confidence of the people. <clears throat> and of course, he had he had seen with the uh, with the drama of the nineteenth century in Liège that in Limburg, when they discovered the coal mines, that something must be done in order to to, to hold together. Uh, belonging to the church and working uh, in an indust industrial zone. And this, that is maybe not the, the merit of Phillips, it's more the merit of Monsignor Brooks and before of, of the Dominican Rutte. But it is, it, in my view, it is unique that a professor, professor at a university, pays half of, uh, invests half of his time in taking care of the Catholic youth movement and being engaged in the Christian workers movement. And thus, I think he saw it and he realized that being a professor is one thing, but being at the service of the, uh, of the community is another thing. That is for the first, where did he get it? And it is interesting to see that already in, uh, in 51, in his book on the laity, he is developing ideas that will come back in what is chapter two of Lumen Gentium. Voilà, that's the first. The second, with regard to the Holy Spirit, here I have to mention something uh, that I maybe did not uh, uh, emphasize enough. What was new? What was new in, uh, in the teaching in Leuven with uh, Philips? That was that he was not that he was dealing also with the, the Greek fathers and with uh, their view on the Holy Spirit. And as you know, in the Orthodox tradition, the Holy Spirit was in the 50s of much more importance than in the Catholic world. To give one example, when the text on the liturgy was uh, ready, Sacrosanctum Concilium, they discovered that they had forgotten the Holy Spirit. And so when you check now the Holy Spirit, sometimes it's mentioned on places that you think, well, what the hell is the Holy Spirit doing here? I mean, it doesn't make sense. So they were on the way to rediscover the Holy Spirit. Uh, it also had to do with the view on the bishop. It is only in 1955 that people are rethinking the the model of the bishop up to 1955, the bishop was a manager, was a, the prince of the local community. Uh, he had to know uh, canon law and he, he was a, really a, a kind of a eudex. Well, in 55, then you, you have as it were, the rediscovery of the charismata needed to be a good pastoral uh, person, a good pastoral bishop. And also that is something that you will discover when you look into the Greek patristic world. You have a, another view on the Holy Spirit, another view also on the Trinity, of course, than what you will find in the West. In the West, uh, apart from, from Augustine's De Trinitate, after him, do you know of great treatises reflecting on the Holy Spirit? Uh, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see great thinkers in the patristic era in the West uh, developing great ideas about the Holy Spirit. The East, it is. And that is where uh, Philips will, as it were, find his inspiration. And of course, uh, there's also after the Second World War a whole 
yeah, a whole new interest in, in, in let us say, in people uh, no longer love to hear uh, about the neo-scholastic theology, especially outside Rome, yeah? but also in Rome. I want to say here that, for instance, in the Gregorian, uh, people like Father Dedza or uh, uh, Munoz Varga, that these people really want to give up the scholastic approach. These people are the opponents to a new text, um, uh, sanctifying, uh, sanctifying uh, um, Thomas. Eh? These people, and they are living in Rome, living in the Gregorian. You cannot understand the tension between the Biblicum and the uh, and uh, Lateranum in 62, 63, think of Lyonnais, yeah? Uh, you cannot understand them if you do not take into account that there is a kind of a rediscovery, rediscovery of the rich sources of uh, the early church. The whole liturgical movement will find its inspiration from the time of uh, Dom Lambert Boudouin up to Sacro Sanctum Concilium, will find its inspiration in the plurality in the plurality of uh, liturgies in the in the history of the church, uh, and it is interesting to see that the great promoters, great promoters of the liturgical movement, I think, for instance, of um, Marty Moore, but also of Dom Capel here of the Kaiserberg, they were first and foremost patristic scholars. They were patristic scholars. Dom Lambert Boudouin is a great promoter of a re-appreciation of orthodox theology. And orthodox theology is characterized by an enormous respect for the early, uh, enormous respect for the early uh, church and for the Greek patristic authors. I think that all these things together explain why for Phillips, Laity was important and why the Holy Spirit was so important. And it's a pity that because he passed away in 72, that he could not finish that last book on the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay. Is that an answer? Well, that's an answer. Yeah, definitely an answer. Um, and a lot more to kind of develop out of that too, I think. Uh, I think we're nearly on the half hour now. So unless somebody's got a very short question, we might need to move to a conclusion. If you do have any final word to just jump in. Otherwise, I think we might uh, uh, move to thanking Matthias. But look, as I, I, as I said earlier, it's been really a fantastic introduction to the Phillips the person. Oh, yep, sorry. Question, I, I like that very much. Uh, the idea of the consensus of Phillips. Uh, you see the question? The question on the consensus, and uh, and first, no, you, you you, I don't see it anymore. Oh, yeah. was a, yes, a, a very uh, interesting question on the consensus. May I say something on that? Sure, yeah, sure, sure. Yep. Sorry, I missed that question. Yep. Uh, I also uh, well, I want to say something about that because of the the, the upcoming uh, synod. I, I think I think that. A respectful consensus is a consensus in which everybody can see the rationale of the decision and can, as it were, partly ident identify him herself. Quite often, consensus is understood as one group uh, has taken the lead and the, the, the wishes of other people are not taken into account. For students, uh, for Phillips, that is not consensus. Eh? For Phillips, consensus is that you, at the end of the day, have a text in which, let's say, 95% of the people can recognize themselves. What is our problem with previous synods? That we get a text where 10% of the people can recognize themselves, and the other 90% are either disappointed or no longer interested. And that is not what uh, Phillips has in mind. For Phillips, a consensus is something in which everybody is engaged. And that is the reason why I said a couple of minutes ago, synodality can only succeed when we give up absolute monarchy. Consensus 
a consensus can only be reached when all people in the room can do their say. And that is not possible in, in the beginning and the end. There is the blessing by the bishop and we can all go home. And he continues as he was doing for another two, about, about 20 years. And that is what, what is the point of Phillips. And I can say this because Phillips was a, a monsignor and I was a professor and I was much more clever than I myself. And he did much more in the council than many uh, other bishops together. But for him, consent is that. Okay, and that is something I wanted to say at the end. There. Thanks very much, Matthias. That's probably a really great place to uh, conclude as uh, Philip's kind of uh, precursor, if not pioneer of, uh, of a synodal approach. I must admit, when you were speaking about him, uh, yeah, a great model, in fact, I think. Uh, so I do think we'd better conclude now. Perhaps if there's people want to stick around for a few minutes afterwards, that might be possible. But I think we better formally conclude. And I just would like to do so by once again thanking Matthias because really it's an outstanding presentation and uh, really brought to life uh, uh, Jared Phillips and the way that the council documents were put together and also the way synodality can work in the future. Thanks very much, Matthias. Fantastic. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for the questions. Uh, uh, I think that if I were in, in Australia, we could continue for another two days. Oh, so, but anyway, no, we have to conclude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's been great. Yeah. Lots of things to take up for the future. Thanks. Thanks again, everybody. All yes. right. Well, I guess some of you got to go for dinner. I've probably got to go and cook dinner, actually. So we probably better uh, wrap up. Uh, Matthias, I'll be uh, in contact with you to hopefully see you in um, Rome in a few weeks, and if not there, yeah. in love. Yeah. Looking for both. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. Thanks to everybody for being with us. Mm, thank you. See you all next time. Yep. Bye bye.